Hey guys, this is uh, Stéphane Wutarichard and uh, welcome to this making of Down the Rabbit Hole. So, uh, I didn't record the full process for this image, so what I'm going to do in this making of, I'm going to go through all the files I've recorded and all the different stages and uh, I will share with you uh, uh, the uh, state of mind and the different uh, thought process and techniques and all the uh, technical stuff I can share about the making of this image. So, Sim, I think in image making, having Sims before starting to make an image is obviously is essential. And this is something we are required to have in professional environment simply because we have a brief and the brief already convey um, the same. But when you are doing personal work, it might it might be tempting to just go for something we like to do and try to figure out a story as we as we go and not being conscious about the theme we want to talk about. And I think most of the time see, it will probably work. But for myself, what I, I've been trying to do in this image and when I try, what I try to do in many of my images right now since a while, since maybe one year, is to have sim before starting to make the image because having sims allow me to to create, to build the storytelling, or even more importantly, something I'll cover in the next in the next lesson, to build up a potential for a deeper storytelling, which is going to change from one viewer to another. So this is why I, I refer it as, as a potential for storytelling and not necessarily uh, an obvious storytelling. And having sim in the first place is very important because this is on these sims that many things can build up after this. Uh, I think about this, this, this tool uh, I've been building and maybe I'll detail it in, a, in another tutorial. But basically, this stage here of symbolism is possible and can exist um, along with the storytelling, which is a drama, if we have a sim in the first place. At least it could exist without a sim, but when you have a sim, it's it's easier to start to build all these little elements that are going to refer to various stages of the sim. Uh, so let me explain what are the sim I wanted to cover in this image. So it can make sense. So the first theme was the initiatic experience or the passage from one state of consciousness to another state of consciousness through an event or, uh, um, or an aging or something that happened in your life that, that helped you to, to, to move from one state to another. The second theme was in reference to the, to the first one, the passage from childhood to grown up. And the third theme was the theme of introspection, diving into your own subconscious, to your own, um, your own inner representation and symbolism of the world, which, which is also something I wanted to cover. So introspection. And the fourth theme was some, Thing also I wanted to add in this image that, that is important for me is the hyper the hypersexualization in modern society and especially hypersexualization for for young girls. So these are the four theme, main theme I wanted to cover in this image and and all these themes they they help me afterward to to build my storytelling and to build my symbols based on the, all these elements. After the themes come inspiration, because I believe that art is mainly a collective achievement. What I mean by that is by building up art on top of other artists and, and um, putting yourself in the idea that you're not only creating something on your own, but you are creating something based on what has been done before you and on, on using the, uh, 
the achievement and the the, the artworks and the the uh, the art in general of other artists before you, then you are going to create something which is going to be stronger than if you were trying to build something on your own without any referencing on without building up on top of the other artist. So inspiration really for me come to this try to find the the artist that i really like the artwork or the stories or the books and the the the, the movies that really inspire me and try to build on top of this so the inspiration for this image there is three main inspirations there is first obviously there is alice in wonderland which is maybe the first the first thing I don't know if this is the first thing, but something that is quite obvious with the presence of this white rabbit here and this girl falling down in something that really refer to, to a vortex or our hole. The second uh, reference is a reference to, to Matrix, which is an inspiration here, which is very just a reference. You know, it's, it's something that is not present, that is not really present at the visual level, but it's still something that I've been using to build upon it, um, especially at the storytelling level. So there is this reference here of this girl trying to reach back to this blue pill after throwing down the red pill. So I will, I will come into storytelling and, and, um, and semantic, uh, not semantic, but, but uh, symbolism. Uh, in the next uh, in the, in the next uh, video but um, right now yeah so there is this reference to to the matrix and the third reference is the reference to the first third inspiration is is a children book which is named where the wild things are so it has a different name depending on the country you are living in uh, in french it's uh, max et les maxi monstres uh, it's a really a great children's book. I, I read it when I was myself a, ch a child, and I read it to my to my own children. And this this monster, they are they are really inspired by the monster of where the wild things are. Uh, there is secondary references, obviously. Uh, I really like uh, the world of uh, Hayao Miyazaki. So there is. It's not it's not really present here, but that's something I I, I like to to have in, in the back of my head when I'm making images. Uh, so color wise, I, I I really love like very colored things with with very strong local colors. This is really what I wanted to have here, uh, and also to reference kind of this 60, 70 representation of what uh, an initiatic. Um, introspection through through products like LSD could be. I never tried it myself, but there is in popular culture this idea that when you are taking some kind of of of, uh, of drugs, you you can have an initiatic experience. And often these this are represented with like these very crazy and strong local colors. But the challenge, and I'm going to talk about that later, the challenge with very strong and and completely uh, disparate uh, local colors is to make them work together in a harmonious way. So it's been it's been another another thing I wanted to to add in my image. And uh, yeah, I think this is it for for inspiration, <laughs> symbolism and storytelling. So I think images have this incredible power to to set a potential for storytelling and for analysis and i use the word potential because for me it's it's really something i really love in images that i, I find very interesting is to not tell a story but create the potential for the viewer to create his own story and i think it's it's much more interesting because when you start to exactly tell what things are about and exactly give all the, the story to, to the viewer, then the viewer is going to look at the image, figure out the story, and he's going to move on, and, and it's done. You, you said your story. But when you are creating a potential 
for storytelling, then you, you are offering the, the possibility for your viewer to spend more time in the image trying to figure out what is happening. And I think it's, it's much more interesting for me. I remember when I was a child, these images I was looking at where I couldn't really understand was what was going on at first. So I had to spend time in this image to, to try to figure why the character had certain expression or what was they doing, you know? And, and then you start to really build all a world that is based on your own experience of the world. And the story you are going to come with in this very specific case for yourself might be completely different from the story that another person is going to make up with the same images, with the same image. So this is, this is what I try to achieve in my, in my image and what I really try to achieve in this image to create the potential for storytelling and for symbolism. So I'm going to go through my, my own story. <clears throat> but what could be interesting right now is that you pause the video and really try to build your story. And then you, you continue and you listen to my own story and, and you see if we have the same interpretation. So there is several for me layer of storytelling, but the first obviously is this girl who is falling into this, this uh, giant environment. And she, she tried to reach back to this blue pill and she threw away the red one. So the red pill, as we know from the matrix, is, this, is a symbol for accessing the unknown knowledge, for accessing to another level of understanding. And sometimes I think there is this moment in life and especially when you are moving from childhood to grown up where you want to you don't want to go in the in the adult world because all of the sudden you, you start to to access because you took the the red pill which is just growing growing up you start to see the world from a different point of view and it can start to become to become very really scary and as you are changing, and I think this is something that really happened for, for, for girls when, when they start to, to reach uh, the, the adult age and, and society start to really looking at her not now as a child, but as a woman. And in the same way, see, some people can start to, to objective uh, this person and start to, to see to see her as an object of, of desire instead of, as a, of a person, especially with the internet and, and all the, the access we have to this imagery. And it can, it can be very really scary. So this, this, is, this is what I wanted to illustrate here. She, she already obviously took this red pill because this environment, she already is in her. But now she wants to she want to reach back to that blue pill. She she wants to go back to what where she she was before, like Cypher in in Matrix. And this is this is this is its main idea. Uh, this this dude here, these monsters, they they can be several things for me. They can be the gentle monsters that you find in the in where the wild things are. You know, at the end, they, they can represent who, who own emotion, who own perception of the world, or they can represent, you know, the, the grown up. Some people that were at some point perceived as kind and gentle people, but when you try to, when you start to reach to a certain level of, of awareness of the world that exists around you, and you start to perceive that maybe they have different intention toward yourself than, than what you were thinking at the, in the first place. And all the students, these smiles, they pass from a state of being gentle smiles of gentle monsters to maybe something completely different. Maybe this is, you know, desire. Maybe this is 
a different intention there is behind this monster. And it can be super scary to realize that the world is just more complicated that, than having gentle people and bad people. Uh, here, this dude here, you know, they are, they are observing the scene. So they are a reference for in, in this society of high images we have everywhere. We, we, we tend to observe the world in, in a safe place, which is behind our screen. So we, we want to have this experience of emerging ourselves into um, imaginary worlds, into representation of the world that are more appealing that, than what we have in our day to day. But we still want to do it from the safety of, of, of a place where we are not completely involved. So, so this is what these guys are. And yeah, as I said, it's, it's really potential because now from here, there is like many symbols that can build up on top of it. And, and you can come with your own story about what is happening in here. You know, so there is like this vortex that I wanted to create through composition that come down to this to this blue pill here. And I wanted these monsters to be a mix of of uh, gentle characters, ridiculous characters at the same time. And I wanted them to have something extremely scary about the, their expression, you know, just so I can build the doubt about their intention. This way, it's it's not really not really possible to to know if they are see if, if they have good intention or or if they have another thing behind their mind. So the main character here. I wanted her to be a total cliche of hypersexualized representation of girl in society. So this is why I wanted her to have this this pink panty and to have like just a slight hint of her breast. And there is no possible way to tell if this character is a young girl or if she's a young woman. Is, this is really what I wanted to create. I wanted to, to create a situation where, as a viewer, you are observing her in an uncomfortable situation, right? But she is not aware of this. She, she, she didn't ask for you to, to look at her panty, basically. So, as a viewer, you have to decide how you are going to look at her. Do you want to look at her as... Um, an object of desire? Do you want to look at her as an innocent girl, which is simply falling into into her hole? Uh, do you what what do you what story do you want to build about about this girl? You know, do do you want like some people did uh, when I published this image? Do you want to look at her as a seven year old Alice, Alice, which is which is impossible because Alice, if she's seven year old, she can't have already this. Um, this kind of, of body type. Uh, and by the way, this is something I, I really find awesome about Alice in Wonderland is the, um, the decrepancy there is between the affirmation that Alice is seven. This is something I believe we know from the sequel of Alice in Wonderland where, where she says that she is seven. And in the same time, when you look at the, uh, the, the, uh, all the things she's going through in Alice in Wonderland, they are more problematic of, of, um, of teenager, you know, changing bodies, repression, representation of your body, which is changing in, in, a, in huge proportion in very short amount of time. And, and the fact that all the students all this adult grown up world that was around you, that was super reassuring and super clear because your parents help you to have a clear definition about who is kind and who is not kind, who, who is bad and who is, who is good. All of a sudden it starts to change because you, you start to accept, 
you start to have an understanding that the world is much more complicated than that. And you, you, you start to be totally uh, confused about this world around you. All of a sudden, there is part of the world that was inexistent for you that, that starts to, to come to your understanding. And this is, this is extremely scary. And I think Alice in Wonderland for me is really about, about this moment in life where your body is changing at a teenager age. And it, and it's, it's, it came with a lot of, um, of deep questioning about the world you are living in. So Alice, she's falling along with this balloon which which are carrying these spectators. So in a way, these spectators, they are traveling through this initiatic experience with this character. Another thing I, wa I wanted to play with in this image at the storytelling level is really what we find in Alice in Wonderland, which is this deep, deep, uh, deep incoherency in scale about different elements. So this is why I really wanted this rabbit here to, to feel huge. So I had to figure out a way to make it look huge based on the depth of different elements. Uh, I really wanted to have this ridicule, ridiculous scale about all these elements that are working together and, and that help to make her feel extremely vulnerable, vulnerable and uh, extremely fragile. So overall, the way I see visual storytelling in illustration is to use cultural references, free association, and combinatory plays in order to create a potential for interpretation by your audience, but not giving them a clear explanation of, about what is going on. And visual storytelling in another context, like visual development for animation, or visual storytelling in concept art for video game or for movie might be different because sometimes it's it's good to be extremely clear and obvious about what is going on. But I think in illustration, an illustration is something that is meant to be looking looked at for maybe a bit longer than, than a concept art or than a visual development piece which is here to communicate a clear concept or, or a clear idea about a second short form of art. But in illustration, you really want to have something that an audience can focus on for more than just 10 or 20 seconds. And by creating this potential for an interpretation, then you create a lot more interest for the viewer to look at your image. Combinator replays and free association are the, the two, two tools that I use the, the most in my images. Uh, what are they? So combinator replay is a fair fact of associating two elements together. This is it, simply it. But this is an extremely powerful tool because if I ask you right now to pick two of the most unexpected things to put together. And we make a poll and we see what people come with. I think we won't have two times the same association. And as simple as it is, associating together two, three or more different elements that shouldn't be together in the first place is one of the simplest and more efficient way to create something new in, uh, in, in the limit of what this could mean. And uh, this is a simple tool, but I use it all the time. So yeah, combinatory plays is, is an extremely important and powerful tool you can use in, in uh, visual storytelling, in, in concept art, in visual development. And free association, 
free, free association is more of a, Freud, of a Freudian concept and is the fact to let your subconscious to do the association work for you. We live in organized society, which means that people that are living in the same society as us have a lot in common with us. They, we have a lot of difference, obviously. But we have more in common than we have in, in, uh, in difference. And, and free association work at a level where you are going to refer to your own symbolism that you've been constructing through your experience of the world. And by doing this at a visual storytelling level, you can, you can be sure that most of the time the symbolism that you are going to let happen unconsciously in your image is going to talk to someone else who belongs to the same society that you've been in. I mean, it can have huge difference of symbolism between, let's say, West Africa and Vietnam. But if you are from Vietnam and you are building an image for, for Asian people, chances are that a lot of the symbolism that you've been building unconsciously for yourself is going to work at an unconscious level for other people. And when you let the free association happen, you let your mind solve the, the, the problem for you of making two different things work together. And the beautiful things of letting unconscious symbols talk for you is that instead of telling a story to your audience, you are now creating a potential for them to build their own story. Composition. So, composition, uh, I just want to talk about the composition of this image. And here is a rough outline of the composition. And I want to tell already that I didn't plan this composition at all. It, it happened, but I didn't plan it. And this is something that I developed over time because I really love composition. I love to look at a lot of composition and to look at a lot of images. And at first I, I was trying very hard to build my composition from scratch and to to plan them very consciously and spend a lot of time to to define all the the different structure and 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 values and big shapes and so on. But with time, what I started to do instead is just to let once again, at an unconscious level, let things organize by themselves and just try to move things around at the at the spot where I feel it looks right. And, and this is what it gives. This is a post outline I did of the composition. And it just happened. It just, it just a habit of, of trying to organize things, things together. So I knew I wanted this kind of huge vortex and spiral that would bring uh, the eye towards this, uh, this hand and this blue pill. So at first, as I wasn't sure I wanted to have a blue, a blue pill in here. So I knew maybe I, I could add a blue pill, but I wasn't completely sure. But I, I knew it would be at the same spot at this hand. And yeah, when I, I start to look at things, generally, I, I, start to, I start to balance and to organize elements. I, I will take, for example, this guy and move it around and say, okay, maybe it's better here, maybe it's better here. And after a while, when I find the correct spot, most of the time I start to realize that things, they are aligned along very strong structures. And I think this is really a product of the, of the habit. But see, all this balloon here is aligned along this fit along this strong line here, which is going through that shape over here and through the, the clouds. And along the shirt, the line of the shirt and 
just the line of the uh, of the panty hair through the through the shadow of the of the leg and the feet and then towards balloon. Honestly, I didn't plan that. Really, I did. I never planned that. But after when I was constructing the image, I'm going to show you how I'm doing it after technically. But when I'm constructing the image, I, I keep moving things around. I'm moving the light. I'm moving the, an element. I, I push it to the right, to the left, to the top, to the down, changing the light a little bit in key shot up to the point where I feel it looks right. And most of the time when it looks right, it's because without really thinking about it, it starts to be aligned along stronger a strong structure. I'm trying to, to figure out if I have, I have something to add, but uh, a few years ago, I used to do super advanced ana analytical uh, <laughs> studies of master composition. And I had like this very, very interesting discussion with a friend who said to me, but did you ever try to take a random picture, any random picture, and try to apply the same analytical thinking to this image to see if after all, Maybe this this old master, maybe they didn't plan as much as we would like to think they planned. And I started to do that, to take from them picture. I tried to analyze them. And, and most of the time I, I was finding myself being conscious of some of these of this structural elements that was totally random, but that was still here. So I think when you've been exposed enough to composition, even though this, this structure is just a potential, then after, after a while, by moving values around, uh, exaggerating sh uh, plan separation, shape separation, your eye it tends to spot these strong structural elements and you, you, you tend to, to want to exaggerate and stylize this uh, alignment of things. So this was just an outline of the structure, because I think the structure is not everything at all in an image. It's just a small part of how you are going to organize edges and values in order to create interest and to lead the eye into the image. Because generally the eye do one simple thing. It goes from the big shape to the small shape. And it goes from rough to details. So I think the important thing to ask is what is a detail? And I think a detail is not explaining in very small what something is. Uh, I think many people tend to think that this is what detail is. You, you just take something and you explain it with scribbling and the, 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 uh, the, the the finest the grain is, the more it is detailed. I don't think this is detailed at an abstract and, and visual cognitive level. I think at, at cognitive level, what an eye, what your eye see as a detail is a high density of small shapes with a high contrast. It might be a high density or simply a, a high contrast in size. Like for example, here we have Let me pick a brush and explain what I'm seeing. We have we have like here are this. Let me pick a terrible color to make sure we see it. There is like this lozenge here, and in this lozenge, which is mostly um, of a of a general value of this value here. See if I'm opening my window, my color window. Well, we are very close in value from here to here. 
So this is this is mostly this shape. And inside this shape here, we have a few very small shapes with high contrast. This cloud here, here, and and then this is this is for me this is detail. Detail. This is it. This is something completely abstract. Detail is abstract because I mean if we're looking in, at this image at this size here, well, you we see this kind of triangle here, this kind of V, but we still see this very small spot, bright spot, which detach itself into this V shape, kind of lozenge shapes, right? So here, another abstract shape here. Composition, it's, it's mostly, for me, about abstract shapes. It's about creating abstract shapes that help to read the image. So there is one shape here, one shape here, one shape. And even, even if we go broader, this is even one shape here. One big, big shape, right? And we have Let's see in very small and black and white because it's more obvious. Now we have like one shape here. And we have detail here again. It, it starts to become a detail because we have all the student a high density, a higher density of small shapes. So we have this very dark spot here and very bright spot here, and again, a bright spot here. So this creates a detail. So the eye go is going to spot this detail. And then what the eye tends to do as a natural thing is to follow edges toward another point of high contrast. So right now there is this spot, then there is an edge here. And right just after we have another high contrast spot here with this bright spot and all around a more simple rest area of, of uh, simplified values. So balancing big shapes with low contrast, with low local contrast, creates resting area for the eyes and spicing up with this spot, these bright shapes. Like for example, I don't see here a girl and legs, I see a bright spot and a very another very bright spot in a bigger shape simply simplified shapes and this is detailed this is what the eye is going to catch you can you can add as much details as you want in here you know pick a very small brush and just use to, it's like too contrasty and start to add like these crazy details. There is so little contrast in here that the eye is never going to pick this. You know, we don't see it. So this is for me the difference between details and texture. For me, texture, we can see it here, the grain paper. This is a high density of very small details of very small shapes, not details, high density of very small shapes with a very low contrast. And when, when you have a high density of small shapes with a low contrast, it is a texture, it's not a detail. And when you start to have a high density and a high contrast in shape size and a high contrast in values, it starts to become a detail. And the eye want to solve what this event is in the visual spectrum. And I just want to, to refer quickly back at this uh, tool, an analytical tool I did for myself. And, and uh, I think I, I really want to make um, a longer video to explain this, uh, this pyramid. And once again, I just want to repeat that this pyramid is not meant to be like a universal definition of what composition in figurative art is. I think this would be uh, pointless because 
I don't think art can be bound by rules, sim by simple rules like that. But for me, it's just an analytical tool that helps me to decide what is important in an image and what is less important. And obviously for me, detail is the less important thing, especially the kind of detail we just talked about before, which is this crazy, super small, uh, low contrast things that we, we add on top of things, which are in fact just texture. But yeah, abstraction, dynamic, which I just talked about, how you organize your structure, how you organize your shapes in order to create a visual path for the eye to, to follow along and stay inside the image and go from one spot of storytelling interest to another spot of storytelling interest because obviously this abstract white shape also belong to at the semantic level here yeah when we start to analyze the image at the semantic level this bright spot also belong to a character and this character is interacting with other character in through symbols and through, through action, they interact in order to create a potential for storytelling. Yeah. So I think for now, this is, this is it for, for what I wanted to cover about composition, because this is a whole entire subject and I I can't cover it in this making of because it's not the point. But uh, I hope this is going to be to be enough to, to explain uh, how this composition is working. So, as I haven't recorded the whole process, I'm, I'm going to go through just a couple of files to see the different states they were in and most important, how I'm, I am organizing my workflow between uh, the brush and key shots in order to focus on the storytelling and the, the 2D image and not on the sculpt itself. So this is, this is the, um, the key shot scene. And something uh, I think which is extremely important uh, in my workflow, I believe, is, is the fact that I'm having this key shot window open right since the very, very beginning. Uh, as soon as I can, I, I open key shot, and generally I have key shot on my second screen. I open key shot, I set up a camera and a rough light. And then as soon as I have a meaningful geometry, I'm sending my geometry into key shot. So, this is my 2D Canva. I think about these windows not as my, my 3D render. I think about these windows as my painting. This is, this is my painting and I'm starting to paint right from here. And in the process I'm using that I'm going to show you later, it's, it's extremely important for me to have a very, very clean and almost definitive composition right from the beginning. So. When I speak about the composition, I'm not speaking necessarily about the shadow to light ratio or the, the values ratio, but I sp I'm speaking more about the edges and the structure of the image because it's going to be, in my process, much more complicated. It's not impossible, it's totally possible, but it's going to be more complicated to move things around um, later in Photoshop. So generally, if I have, if suddenly I realize that I've completely messed up my composition, I, I can move things around, but I tend to move them later in the process in, in Photoshop. So what I wanted to emphasize is that focusing on composition very early at this stage of the painting, because it's, it's really painting here, is very important. So, um, I try also to reuse a lot when I'm building these images because the point is not to improve my sculpting skills. When I want to, to improve at sculpting, I, I'm doing series uh, 
recently I wanted to to improve at at sculpting and uh, and portraying characters, so I did a series about that. But in these images, I tried to reuse as much as I can. So I I believe most of these characters. Unfortunately, I don't have the history now about these characters. But most of most of these characters, if I remember properly, there are base meshes that I took from here. So I think there is uh, there is this mesh here, Julie, that I use. I think for this one here. And if you look at it closely, you can see there is roughly the same the same pose we have on Julie. So I took I took Julie. I can quickly show you the kind of of stuff I did. Uh, pick Julie. I um, started to no there is yeah there is subdivision took my inflate brush started to inflate the character just to, to de destroy the indications of uh, of geometry and no. Maybe do this. Because I, I had this this idea for the main character in the first place. So it's it was much simpler for me to simply uh, go from a base mesh and you know simply start to deform it. It's it's much faster like that. And I think after that I did something in that style, just selected part of the geometry and started to use deformations, inflate the geometry like that, flatten it. You know, just having fun with trying to think about the character and not especially about the uh, the performance of uh, of sculpting and i try to say to stay when i'm starting i'm trying to stay as rough as possible because i want to be able to send a geometry in in key shot as soon as possible no inflate Deform, move down. Yeah, and uh, we have kind of the same, kind of the same character that we had in here. Tuck, 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 where, where, where it is. Ah, it's funny because, okay, now I know, you know, there is a name here. So it was with the Nixi Human Mal Average. So it's here, it's this one. So. I did it with this one, but as you see, I've been able to replicate the same character in, in five minutes, kind of five minutes with uh, with with Julie. So it doesn't matter. I mean, I, I could have done it from scratch. It really doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. So once I have my character. I'm sending it as soon as possible into um, into Keyshot. Yeah. Uh, do, so same thing for this one. Maybe this one was from a Julie. I don't remember. Yeah. No, Julie. Yeah, yeah. It has a name. So this one was from the Julie mesh. Uh, so this one was from a DAZ 3D model, but as you can see, there is nothing much left from the DAZ 3D model. That's why, why it's called Genesis. Uh, this one too was from a DAZ model. 
And I deformed, I quickly deformed it the same way, just uh, blowing things around with the uh, inflate brush and try to destroy very quickly the initial uh, the initial anatomy because I, I really want to go as fast as I can towards the, the idea I have. So reusing, I'm, re I'm trying to reuse a lot. So for this uh, rabbit, I, I quickly looked on I quickly looked on Turbo Squid if I could find just a quick model because I, I feel no pr pride in sculpting a rabbit. So if I can find a rabbit that can work for me, I will I will take it, and uh, it can make me gain, you know, always an, an hour of work. So for for ten bucks, it 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 worth it. Because my point here is about telling a story. It's not about sculpting an amazing rabbit and. Uh, I found that this rabbit had just the correct level of uh, of cartooniness I wanted, and uh, overall the way I repainted I painted on top of it afterward I I I, I managed to uh, get rid of the uh, over cartoony stuff that was obvious in the character because I I just wanted to have like a base mesh I could deform quickly and send it in key shot to, to have an element to interact with my light and try to figure out if my patterns of light and shadows were going to work in my composition. And after that, once I have the base mesh, I can always just, you know, change it for so it can work for me the same way. This was a Daz, this was Julie and this was the Nick Human base human uh, anatomy Nixi Nixio Carrello in the brush and uh, yeah. So same thing reuse a lot. So these rocks here in the background. You know, I I just I just took some base rocks. And I think these are rocks from, I, I forgot the name of the artist. Uh, let me, yes, I remember. This was rocks from a uh, David L'Esperance tutorial I bought on Gumroad. And um, he had like this, this, uh, this base rock and uh, I just took it and, and smashed a lot of rock together just to have a background because once again, this is not an image about uh, having uh, beautiful rocks and as you can see we can't even see them at the end but for me having something already done it's it made me gain time and it helped me to concentrate about what really matter for me and it is thinking about uh, light shadow composition and storytelling and once i am once I have like a base geometry in uh, in Keyshot, um, I'm really trying to think about my composition. So I have these windows open on the other screen, and basically, if if I I start to realize that something doesn't work, I'm just picking, you know, my rabbit, and uh, I try to always be conscious of where my camera is, so I know that my camera is is somewhere here and uh, it's uh, let me show you where I think my camera is I would need to disable this uh, auto save feature right now so my camera is is like somewhere here so if I want to move my rabbit in space to put it backward but but keep roughly the same orientation to our camera I can simply move it like that and render and send this to send this to Keyshot. So let me get back the correct material I had. 
So I, gen I generally simply use a 50% a 50% gray material. So I can really concentrate about the structure of the composition based on edges and light and shadow patterns. So at this point, it's really a game of moving things around, you know, deciding, okay, maybe I want this curve here to go more in the back, right? The curve of this character. So I can simply go in the brush, grab my move brush, select this dude, put it in solo mode and isolate the arms like that. You know, and move the back a bit. And a lot of the work I did in this image was about thinking about my cast shadows in this image. So after I, I'll show you, uh, I started to add shadow caster to, um, to change the way the shadows were, were acting with the visible geometry. And also a lot of the, of the work I'm doing in, uh, in 3D involve cheating with 3D because uh, most of the time, I think, I think uh, in in a beginner work, I see this happen all the time. People they tend to overstate the importance of 3D, and because this is 3D, they they tend to think that okay, this is 3D, so this is right, you know. And it doesn't have to be right or wrong. I think what is right is what looks right. It's not what is in the brush or what what is right in the physical 3D world. It has an importance at some point to stay co coherent so the illusion can work, but you can perfectly cheat. Like, for example, I cheated with this character by only adding the head of the character. And here is the shadow caster I was talking about. So it's a simple geometry to cast the shadows over this character. And this head here, I just, I just had the head because I didn't want to have his torso in front of the geometry because I knew I wanted just after the the chin I wanted to have this big this big uh, dark shape we have here see so I completely cheated with the 3D because right now it's just a head floating in the air and if it has actually a real torso we should see the torso that will come maybe probably probably through here, no. So yeah, it's it's a cheat. So it's the same for this character here. It's just a head floating in the air. Okay, so let's move to a later stage. So here is the more final, the brush file. And once the uh, once the, compo the composition was was there with the big the big and simplified shapes, so as you can see, not nothing as I didn't had a lot of change since the the first file, so. Most of the most of the composition stage it happened at a moment where I try to have uh, very very few details on my uh, on my shapes because uh, you, you can see it's a, it's a 20 million polygon scene so it start to become a bit a bit more difficult to move things around there is like a, a bit of lag and delay so uh, this is why I really try to solve the composition problem very early with very simple shapes. Just try to go straight to the point, 
reuse as much as I can, as long as it doesn't constrain me to in my creativity. And when I have a composition that looks right, then I will start to add the details that I think are relevant to add in 3D, because there is always a fine balance to find between detailing in 3D and detailing in 2D. Uh, anything that is related to textures and materials, uh, for me, it's really faster to do it in 2D. But all the uh, interesting details that are going to interact with the lights and, and act as kind of a bevel with a, a, a light side and shadow side, they are, they are faster to do in, uh, in 3D. So I prefer to do it that way. So I wanted this character to, to have a bit of this B appearance. So this is why I wanted have to, to have this kind of flower-like uh, designed with these big eyes that refer to more to, to a bee-like uh, type of character. And I wanted, as I explained in the first place, I wanted these characters to look a bit both monstrous and ridiculous. So they would, they could like either, they, they would look either uh, dangerous or either gentle, depending on who is reading the image and what mood they are in. And uh, you can see uh, I decided to, to move the rabbit around and to make it look very, very small. So let me have a look at, at this, uh, this character here. I'm going to zoom into it. Ah, sorry, it's not the proper rabbit. So this thing about re reusing is also to gain time. It's not about uh, not being able to sculpt something and uh, and having to use a mesh instead. I mean, I, I'm I think I have no no issue at all to for sculpting a rabbit or sculpting a, a character or whatever. So if at some point something is start to to make me lose time because I have to look on the internet for something, I'm going to sculpt it. So it really depends. If I can find something on the on the internet or in my reference folder to use, because I think about it, and if I can find it in less than two or three minutes, I'm going to use it. Otherwise, I'm going to sculpt something from scratch. So here's the, here's this rabbit with a with a bit of clothing, and once again, it, it doesn't have to be perfect. It's it's just to catch uh, the light and add a bit of indication of how the light and shadows are going to interact with the sh 